Hello and welcome to Galen Data's Medical Device Innovation Webinar Series. My name is Keith Drake. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Galen Data. We are joined today by Abbas Dilawala, an industry expert in medical device connectivity and also Galen Data's Chief Technology Officer. Today, we're going to explore a wide range of topics, the core software, hardware, regulatory, security, and buy versus build considerations critical for success when implementing medical device cloud connectivity. And of course, we will take your questions. Abbas, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Sure, Keith. Um, so my name is Abbas. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and the co-founder of Galen Data. I have uh, 17 years of software development experience, 15 of those in healthcare. I've been involved in uh, different kinds of software development efforts uh, before given data, uh, from small startups to large medical device companies across very different platforms, so embedded, mobile, cloud, and others. My focus is mostly around cloud software, though, uh, especially around scalability, performance, and uh, cloud security. And I'll share with everybody a little inside secret. The answer to many questions we all have is ask a boss. He knows. So you've got we've got the right guy on the uh, on the webinar today for sure. So with that, let me outline what we're going to talk about today in the next uh, 58 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to start at the end point, the benefits of connected medical devices. There is a wide range, a robust uh, myriad of benefits by connecting your medical device. Some of them are obvious, some not so much. Abbas is going to outline what they are. Uh, and then he'll swerve into defining the need for device connectivity. We'll talk about hardware and software considerations and how they overlap and work in tandem. A very important issue, regulatory. Everything we do must be done with a keen eye on regulatory considerations. So we'll talk about that. Cybersecurity and privacy factors, another important issue. Uh, that a boss will cover. And then lastly, I imagine that many of you are at a build versus buy decision point. Should you build your own connectivity solution or buy a ready-made platform? There's a lot of pros and cons each way, and a boss will do a real good job of giving you your decision points to make that build versus buy decision. So before we get into it, I want to ask you all through our poll that's available now in your GoToWebinar console. It's optional. But what type of organization do you represent? Do you represent a traditional medical device manufacturer or perhaps a company that provides software as a medical device, a healthcare analytics platform, anything more software based? Uh, perhaps you represent a device design or development company, a contract manufacturer. Perhaps your interest is in quality or regulatory and you represent that type of organization. And then if we didn't catch in there's those first four choices, just click other. So I see a lot of answers coming in. You could select either a medical device manufacturer, software as a medical device, device design, development company, quality or regulatory organization, or other. All right, we've got just about everybody has responded. We will go ahead and close out the poll. So Abbas, as I said during the introduction, let's begin at the end point. We've got a good, solid, robust cloud connectivity solution implemented for our medical device. What types of benefits would we enjoy at that point? Sure, Keith. Um, so some of the benefits as listed like here, and I'll, we'll talk about those. I want to talk about first is the remote monitoring aspect to it. So when your device is connected, it can be used in any kind of remote monitoring uh, environment, whether it be telehealth, uh, or just patient compliance monitoring. Uh, telehealth, obviously, in the current environment, uh, very useful. And even after the pandemic, hopefully, uh, goes away, I think the remote uh, diagnosis or remote monitoring is going to be continuing on. There were, uh, you know, already uh, factors in play before the pandemic uh, to kind of move over um, remote monitoring patients, especially in homes um, uh, and pe uh, patients that are on some kind of, uh, you know, either. Um, <coughs> the need to be monitoring much more often uh, instead of give, having them coming in uh, to the clinics much uh, at a much higher frequency but do a lot of uh, remote monitoring instead so i think remote monitoring is going to stay and if you have a device 
that is well suited, connectivity is going to be key to that. The other aspect uh, that you can enjoy with connect devices is higher reimbursement. And this is tied again to data, uh, real world data. Uh, so we, you know, we generally have clinical uh, trials conducted to kind of uh, establish an efficacy of the uh, of the device, but we also require to do a lot of monitoring uh, post market uh, to see that the efficacy is still there. And based on that efficacy, results your coverage, whether through Medicare or traditional insurance, uh, is dependent on that. So collecting the real world evidence, uh, having a connected device makes it much easier. So that's one example. The other example is you know uh, expanding your claim sets. Uh, so FDA has a NEST uh, program, which is a pilot program that essentially allows you to use the real-world evidence uh, that you collect while while uh, devices in, in in field to kind of expand the claim set. Like you can you have a claim that's approved by the FDA, but you have some benefits that are kind of adjacent to that for which you do not have approval right now. And instead of doing a full-blown clinical trial, which can be very costly. The idea here is to take real world evidence and apply that uh, towards instead of being a clinical trial uh, scenario. So that's again a very useful aspect to expand your claim. Uh, opening up new business models. So kind of you know devices are sold today, uh, but there's move towards kind of using device as a service and also diagnosis as a service, where connectivity is key because now you need to know in devices service you need to know the usage. So you're kind of tracking how much a device is being used. And then as a diagnosis, you know, a lot of algorithms, a lot of AI, machine learning kind of algorithms that do diagnosis require data to be collected in a centralized place where your algorithms can then take over. So again, having connected devices benefit in kind of opening up new business models. And then ultimately, for your own teams, uh, for your engineering teams, uh, helpful to know how the device is performing, uh, getting device logs, understanding the device health in the field. If there's a trouble, if there's an issue in the field, able to do the white, uh, remote diagnosis uh, for your quality teams, be able to capture information in case there is a complaint or some sort of action needs to be taken. So all that stuff helps with uh, having connected devices. You mentioned uh, if your device in the field has an issue, and then earlier you mentioned post-market surveillance. I'll guide our audience toward uh, galendata.com, look for our webinars. Our webinar last month was specifically on the value of electronic quality uh, QMS and cloud connectivity for post-market surveillance. Uh, we had Chris DuPont, CEO and co-founder of Galen Data, and John Spear, founder of Greenlight Guru, as our guests. All right, so um, a lot of benefits, but let's, um, let's talk more specifically near term and define the need for connectivity, Abbas. Sure. Um, what I mean by defining the need is to understand, you know, wh why are you using connectivity? What is the actual solution, or what's what's the benefit at the end that you're trying to capture? Whether the benefits for yourself or your teams, whether the benefits patients or providers or insurers, or whatever the stakeholders are. So trying to understand that use case, trying to understand a what somebody will, how somebody will interact with that connected solution. Uh, is key. Uh, often we see, you know, people uh, taking connected or taking any kind of solution and trying to push it into a, a, a established workflow uh, in the, with the idea of that the workflow needs to be changed. That is not always the best case um, because a lot of time you get a pushback. So kind of understanding how your solution will fit into existing workflows or slightly modified workflows um, that that's key to understand. So you have to have the you know you need to consider the interaction with the patients, uh, providers, but also other stakeholders that may be there. Consider a broader set of use cases, right? So instead of only focusing on how the patient is going to be able to you know, access the data, how a provider can access uh, patients' compliance data, can you also look at how your engineering teams will uh, be able to access any health data on the device? How your complaint teams, or your ecology teams, can be able to do that? So look into a broader set and don't focus on like one thing because the data needed and some of the technologies that needed may be different uh, if once you start guarding the use case a little bit. So trying to understand the need, uh, but look at it a broader set and then you can kind of narrow down during implementation. So you may say, okay, you know, we may want to just do a pieces of this for now, but at least start with a broader use case and, and consider a wide variety of stakeholders. And then from the data perspective, so once you kind of figured out your use cases, the next thing to do is what data do I need to capture, right? If I'm looking at a compliance monitoring, I need to know user data about the patient. I need to know maybe trends, uh, why they're not using it. Um, but I also might need to know, you know other factors that may have affected their 
um, their uh, non-use of the device. So, you know, maybe it's a symptom, some other symptoms flared up, maybe it's related to their mental health, it's related to something else. So there may be more kind of contextual data that you may need to cover to kind of understand why someone is not complying with the, with the therapy or, or the prescription. Next thing to see is, you know, once you have data, uh, what kind of uh, data will stay on the device, what kind of processing will happen on the device, and we'll talk some of those later in the presentation. But that collecting data, understanding what data is needed is also important because collecting data comes with risks, and we will talk about that and how you can minimize those. But you need to understand the use case, and you need to understand the data that can back up that use case, and that's kind of the key before you start into kind of designing your collector solution. And once we understand the need for the types of data we need now and as we grow, that brings us to the hardware that's going to collect that data. So let's talk about that for a minute. Sure. So once you, let's say, if you're a hardware device, uh, you have a hardware that's performing your therapy, your diagnosis, your sensing, whatever the, the actual hardware function is, next thing is to figure out what kind of modifications or, or things I need additional to support a connectivity use case. And things like, you know, how do we extract data? Uh, where do we send it? Um, how does data come out of the device? What data stay, stays on the device? What, what doesn't stay on the device? A lot of kind of decisions around that. A few things to consider when you're making that decision is essentially around uh, operating constraints um, of the device itself, frequency uh, of data delivery. How often are you gonna transfer data? How often are you gonna collect data? The bandwidth, you know, if you're transferring a lot of data versus uh, a lot of little data or, or a, you know, very little but a large amount of data. And then how does the user of the device, whether it be patient or a provider, interact with that device? So those all kind of come into play. And some examples, you know, and they're interrelated. For example, uh, space of the device, so how big the device is, can dictate, you know, size of power supply, right, antenna, and that will affect you know, how much storage you can have, how much memory you can have. Power constraints will limit the frequency uh, with which you can transfer amount of storage uh, transfer protocols. Uh, bandwidth obviously will affect frequency as well. Uh, processing capabilities that you can put on, on board uh, the device that will dictate how much data can be collected and processed on board. So if you can collect a lot of data but not process because you have processing capabilities, now you will need to transfer a whole lot more data requiring uh, maybe higher frequency, but also higher bandwidth. So all that kind of comes into play. Um, connect wireless protocols, uh, also an important aspect, uh, specifically if your device is going to be in a constrained environment, for example, hospital, uh, where you may not be able to get on a Wi-Fi easily, or if you do get a Wi-Fi, you still have a lot of uh, video frequency uh, interference. Also, if you go into more remoter field, uh, you, can, you may not have Wi-Fi, so you may have to depend on cellular, or something similar. And then lastly, kind of interaction with the with the user. It will design or whether your user is interacting directly with the device. Are they interacting with the screen? Is there a display? Uh, is data stored locally so it can be displayed there? Or does the data need to be, you know, uh, fetched from some remote area, remote place to be able to display to the user? Uh, what kind of interaction they need is all this will kind of come into play as you consider your hardware uh, factors that towards connectivity. What about software, the other side of the coin? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so as with hardware choices, uh, you have to understand the impact that the software choices will have in your connected products. Specifically, I want to talk about a little bit about uh, what we call COTS and SOOP, uh, commercial off the shelf, and then software of unknown provenance. So it's very common uh, to kind of use uh, open source software, specifically free open source software, as a bullet and blocks in software development. Uh, I do it, we do it, everybody does it. Um, but for compliance and security purposes, we need to understand what that means, right? Um, so problem mitigation, because uh, these these software can affect uh, or can contribute to your risks uh, to the patient or the risk to your device in general. So problem mitigation must be put in play. Uh, it's important to choose if you're using an open source software or any software for that, uh, for that matter. It's important to find one that's well supported. Uh, so in open source parlance, that means you know some uh, libraries that are well used. Uh, that is a vibrant community of developers. That there's stability, um, or that you can purchase a reasonable cost that stability uh, and that support. So that's important to understand. Uh, both FDA and other uh, regulatory agencies have uh, essentially guidance on kind of how to integrate 
off-the-shelf software uh, into your medical device in terms of risk management, in terms of version management and stuff like that. And then software design choices, you have to carefully understand how those software design choices will ensure uh, scalability and availability, specifically if availability is key goal uh, in your connected journey. If you need the data to be available at all times, then you need to make sure that your design is, is achieving that kind of availability goals. And then always, because we collect data, security of data and integrity of data must be maintained. Um, some architectures are better suited at this than others, uh, specifically if you are doing uh, on, on the cloud side, a lot of stateless architectures, uh, they allow you to enhance scalability and, and provide more resilience against kind of failures. Um, another thing to consider is how will you update that software, specifically software that's on device, like firmware. How are you gonna deploy uh, any updates? Uh, are you doing off the, sh uh, off the air updates, uh, over the air updates, uh, or you will need to do some sort of, uh, you know, uh, like a USB or, 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 a, or a SD card or something like that that you need to ship and do the updates. It's important uh, because as you put software on devices that specifically talk to the internet, cybersecurity becomes an important point. So ability to remotely update is very, very important uh, to mitigate specifically cybersecurity risks. Abbas, the uh, technology provided by hardware and software, as you just spoke, uh, helps us balance against uh, the use cases for our, our business needs and clinical needs. That's challenging enough. Let's talk about the challenge of regulatory, the alphabet soup. In the past just very few years, we now have GDPR, CCPA. How does all that come into play? Yes, so regulatory considerations are important uh, for your connected uh, de device or your connected infrastructure in general. And there is, it's a, it's a evolving, uh, evolving uh, market. Um, and FDA and other regulatory agencies understand that. They have over time uh, kind of created buckets uh, to put these kind of systems in there. Uh, for example, the medical device data system or the clinical decision support system, two of the categories that are exempt from, uh, from the filing, um, kind of class one uh, in, in, in FDA's parlance, class one systems. They're not exempt from regulatory requirements, they're exempt from filing and getting approval. Uh, but you have to kind of, it's, it's a case by case basis, you have to kind of figure out what are you doing with a connected health component to your device? Is it necessary to your device? And in other ways that it means, in other words, does it actually extend your device? Does it uh, provide an important function uh, towards the actual proper use of your device? And if so, then it becomes necessary to your device and generally class carries the classification of a device. If it's only for data storage and view, you're not doing anything with that data, you just really, you know, data in, data out kind of stuff, you could make it a medical device data systems, or if it's providing some sort of decision support system, like providing some guidance to clinician, only clinicians, in a way that the clinicians can themselves understand what the guidance looks like, how it's being generated, then you can kind of bucket into a clinical decision support system. In many cases, might not be a medical device at all. Uh, unlikely, but uh, that's possible as well. So you kind of understand because the classification will drive a lot of what you need to do. It will drive your effort and your schedule. Um, because if it's you know, if it needs to be filed along with your your device, then it needs to kind of keep pace with that. So it's important to understand how you do classify, and it's possible that you have multiple classification. You can segregate the systems across multiple classification, uh, and then you can kind of essentially manage it that way. You're painting the picture of a multidimensional balancing act, the hardware, the software, the data, now the regulatory. Let's add one more dimension to our balancing act, and that is cybersecurity and privacy. Yeah, so cybersecurity is a big problem. Uh, the data here is from 2019. That's the last year that we have decent data. Uh, but 37% uh, increase uh, in security breaches. This is healthcare only, not general IT, healthcare only. 37% increase in, in security breaches, 100% increase in amount of patient records impact, impacted. And the risks, you know, three main risks is loss of data, um, lost data, uh, loss of availability, which is a bigger issue, uh, specifically if it's critical infrastructure, and then hacked devices. So that's the nightmare scenario. Hasn't happened as much, but there's a risk uh, to that. Uh, most of the time, people are after data, things like names, addresses, social security numbers, biometric data, diagnostic data. These are kind of high value data that people, uh, attackers are after. So protecting that data is super important. 
Uh, part of that um, also is to consider a uh, wide variety of regulations and, and laws that have come over the last few years around trying to protect uh, from a security aspect and product data, but also providing a measure of privacy uh, to users and patients uh, alike. Uh, some of these are here, uh, laws that are being in place, like HIPAA, that have been in place for 20 plus years, uh, that were updated recently with HITECH, but newer laws like GDPR, I said newer, it's been six years, but newer-ish, uh, things like CCPA from California or Masters of Data Protection laws, and there's every state in U.S. is now coming up with its own privacy laws. Uh, there's laws around Children Online Privacy Protection Act, so if your device is targeting children, there's requirements around that. Canada has the Pipette Act, um, where every country has its own thing. So there's a wide variety of laws and regulations to kind of understand and make sure you're, depending on where you are trying to sell, uh, make sure you, you, um, you comply with these. On top of that, the industry has come up with standards. Um, uh, either ISO standards, uh, IC standards 27001 and 27018. Uh, both of those talk about how to manage information security. The National Institutes of Science and Technology has its own set of uh, requirements, also a set of guidance that uh, government agencies are now adopting, specifically military adopted uh, one of those as their go-to uh, cybersecurity requirements. So if you're selling into military, you will need to comply with that as well. There's a Cloud Security Alliance, is a nonprofit that sets kind of best practices uh, around cloud computing, has its own set of requirements. And then one that I think is gaining the most uh, uh, kind of traction in the healthcare is what we call the High Trust. It's a, again an alliance, nonprofit, I believe, uh, but it's an industry alliance uh, that comes up with a set of security requirements. Uh, they call them CSF, Common Security Framework. Uh, and that essentially is a set of requirements that you can apply with and get certified against. So those are kind of considerations you need to make uh, if you're selling. A lot of hospitals now require you to have high trust. Uh, they require uh, your infrastructure to be 27,001 compliant. So a lot of that kind of things uh, become business requirements uh, going forward. A um, few things you can do uh, to kind of uh, manage privacy and security um, in, in your device. The first is to start with risk planning and assessment. Just like you do with the device, you know, identify risk factors that are involved with cybersecurity. You know, who can attack, what are vulnerabilities, what is the attacker can get out of it, uh, what the risk, what's the impact, uh, not only on patients, but also users around it, and also ultimately on your business, you know, in terms of your reputation, in terms of your liabilities, kind of assess all that and identify what, what the probabilities of those events are. Uh, so the risk assessment, just like you do with other things, I think is an important part of cybersecurity. Uh, pro, any kind of cybersecurity program. And then making sure we're designed with security in mind. Security shouldn't be something that you vote on at the end. It has to be something you think about from the get-go. Things like identity and access management. How would you identify people? How would you provide access? How would you take away access when they no longer need it? How are you going to authenticate people? Is it going to be simple username, password? Are you going to have some sort of uh, second factor? Are uh, you going to send them SMS emails? Uh, are you going to have a, you know physical keys? How are you going to do all that stuff? What kind of encryption are you going to have in terms of both storage encryption, but also encryption when you transfer data from you know, one device to something else? Audit trail, something that's required uh, by a lot of these uh, regulations. How are you going to know who did what change when? Those kind of things. Um, doing things like security testing, just like you do functional testing to make sure your device works. Uh, you may do, you know, uh, stress testing. You may, you may, you may break your, try to break your uh, devices by throwing it a thousand ways. Uh, you need to do security testing to make sure that your infrastructure, your your connected health uh, as design aspects uh, can withstand uh, a common attacks. And then ultimately, just like you have a bill of materials for your hardware parts, it's important to have bill of materials or software part. Partly because, as I said, a lot of software is built on other people's software, like open source software knowing which versions of those libraries, when you had it, uh, what are the patches available, because they may have security uh, vulnerabilities. It's important to kind of keep up track of all that stuff. And then uh, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, well, not the last thing, but one other thing I want to talk about is the cybersecurity surveillance program. So like you have risk surveillance programs, so once you once you get into field, you're required to do post-market uh, kind of identification of you know, risks that are being posed by your device um, or your therapy uh, to the patients. We should have a similar cybersecurity surveillance program. 
And uh, a starting place is the NEST cybersecurity framework. It, it essentially has uh, five phases uh, of kind of ways you can think about a surveillance. So one is identify, so identify all your assets, all your uh, systems, what are the risks around that, protect them. So kind of put uh, safeguards in front of them, you know, make sure they're, that they're not open to the world if they don't need to be, make sure they're whitelisted as it can be, uh, have a, a program to kind of uh, apply patches and stuff like that. Detect any uh, issues. So have systems in place that you can detect an attack, detect any problems that come up, uh, have a way to respond to that so that you can quickly shut it down. Uh, you may need a wider variety of people, you know, skill set to be able to do that. And then ultimately recover. So have systems in place for your backups, for your, maybe have a hot site somewhere that you can quickly move around. Uh, so you're not down for a long time. And then uh, understanding, you know, all the transnational, national, state, and local reporting requirements, if you do have a problem, um, because now there's different requirements on how you report, who you report, when you report, and what do you report. And so you're understanding all that stuff and then ultimately having adequate business protection. Um, setting up agreements uh, with your stakeholders is important. And, and the ultimate thing I think is, the thing about is to establish a, uh, a culture of cybersecurity. Uh, very important and often underappreciated aspect of security protection is you need people to think through security. Uh, you regularly want to train them, regularly train your employees, your users, but also kind of create that culture so that security is not back of the mind, it's, it's forefront. All it takes is that one incident, that one oversight, and you're out of business. That's right. All right, well, let's get into our last topic before we head to our Q&A session. I imagine, you know, there's many in our audience who are considering building their own versus buying. There's a lot of pros and cons. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, the build decision does make the most sense. How would you suggest, uh, Abbas, that members of our audience address this issue? Yeah, so, I mean, I think we start with looking at the pros and cons on the build versus buy. Uh, there's there's you know good there's pros of build right so you have a you can have if you build your own you have full control and ownership and you you can get a customizable completely customizable solution that is fits exactly your needs the way you want it uh, the counter argument to building is it takes more money and more time and you introduce a lot of dolphin risk you already have dolphin risk with your therapy with your device with your uh, diagnostic whatever you're building and now you ent ent introduce additional open risk by trying to build the kind of the connected aspect of your of your solution. Um, buy, on the other hand, uh, kind of reverses that. Uh, you generally is more cost effective. It's quick time to market. There's a lot of risk reduction you can have because you, especially if you can use an existing platform uh, that's well uh, you know well tested up in the market for a while. The cons are you may have to compromise some places. Maybe the UI doesn't look exactly the way you want it, doesn't have the right sort of buttons, uh, and you can kind of work around that. And obviously not having full control ownership, but that kind of can come with you know, benefits. Well, you, you don't have full control, but you also don't have full liability and full responsibility around that. The, um, if you are going to build yourself, I would suggest that you start uh, on building on a general purpose cloud infrastructure, like AWS or Azure or something like that. Uh, and you use some of those functions like data storage and you know, uh, databases and, and some, some stuff like that. Do make sure that whatever solution you use are compliant uh, with HIPAA and GDPR or whatever compliance requirements you need. Uh, not all AWS services, for example, are HIPAA compliant. A uh, large majority are, but not all. Also to understand that when you use a cloud infrastructure, they use essentially a shared responsibility model. They're responsible for compliance at the physical infrastructure level. Everything about that is your responsibility. Operating systems, the things you build on top, and the things you put in, the data you put in and get out, all that is your responsibility. So understand that security configurations, and there's a lot of those, uh, have to be done properly. Uh, your development, the solution that you develop should be also be done under, under compliance. Uh, once you have developed, you need to put in operational, you need a skilled team to make sure that operations can happen. Uh, acquire good security monitoring and detection tools, and then develop a you know, disaster management and patching solution uh, that can safeguard your uh, your businesses and, and set up all the agreements that you need to set up. Uh, if you're going to buy, uh, just make sure the solution you're trying to buy or trying to build on top of is built with the required compliance uh, that 
hopefully the solution is fully managed. Again, you want to outsource the burden of doing all the IT management. Understand the track record, like for any vendor, you know, make sure you go through uh, the vendor compliance, uh, make sure the vendor's uh, reputation is good, uh, look at the track record in terms of security and privacy, how many issues they've had, how many, uh, if they had any uh, any attacks or stuff like that, and how they have responded to it. If you do want to go global, like, uh, even if not now, maybe in the future, make sure the solution can scale globally. Uh, understand how you will do that BOM, uh, Bill of Materials Management, in terms of version control. And then understand what responsibility and liabilities the vendor is taking and what commitments they're willing to make. So keep all that into mind when you decide which vendor, if you want to uh, buy from them, uh, to pay. Yeah, that's good advice. Even on the buy side, there's a lot of due diligence that's required to make sure that's the right decision. So if someone's decision is to buy, the Galen Cloud is one of their options. Can you talk about uh, over the next couple of slides, the Galen Cloud and what features and benefits that provides? Sure. Uh, so the Galen Cloud is, is a purposeful, uh, purpose-built platform uh, specifically for medical devices. We target nothing but medical devices. We are, we build everything under ISO 1345 uh, certification, uh, certified quality management system. Uh, we comply with the FDA uh, and Health Canada and European Union regulations and others. Uh, we also comply with a suite of privacy regulations like HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA, and others. Uh, and we, what we have is a highly configurable system. So it allows you to kind of configure the system without writing in you know, a software or without doing much work in terms of configuration aspect to be able to suit your needs. So use case one is different than use case two, and we essentially allow uh, both use cases to work within the system. So very configurable, uh, both kind of a backend but also kind of a front-end uh, system that you can use essentially as close as possible to out of box uh, as, as there's anything out of the market. And I will say, without getting into the details of our broad range of, of current clients, we do have a broad range, implantables, wearables, software as a medical device, that proves the robust nature of the Galen Cloud, given that it meets the requirements of such a broad range of, of use cases. Sure. Uh, some of the features, uh, it's a quick integration, uh, flexible data workflows, we provide web portals that can use out of box. Uh, those web portals provide some sort of data visualization in a configurable way. Uh, access control engine, you decide who has access to what, alerts, um, customization of branding. And if you want to, uh, you can add uh, or have us add any sort of custom modules uh, to kind of extend the feature set of, of the platform that we already have. Uh, this is uh, in terms of cost savings. Uh, we can provide as much as uh, 73% uh, cost savings uh, over a five-year period. Um, and this is from real data, um, so it's not just made up, uh, between build versus buy. So you can kind of see how uh, how cost uh, capital efficient it can be just to use our system. And, and, and then also, say, right, right. in terms of cost savings, you know, in, in working with our clients who have considered the buy versus build decision, a lot of times what they overlook is that long-term cost of maintenance. Uh, for example, the cost, the real cost in both expertise, time, and money of keeping your finger on the pulse of regulatory changes. It is a moving target. All that is baked into the Galen Cloud already. Yes. And, and cost is one. Risk reduction is the other aspect to it. Right, so again, as I said, we build everything under risks, uh, under compliance uh, to both industry standards and regulations. And by being in the business for a long time, having connected a wide variety of use cases or, use, or devices, taken them to market, uh, we kind of pull in the, the regulatory requirements of, of the platform. So using us reduces your regulatory risk. Uh, so we provide certificate of compliances that tell us, you know, you can, and you are welcome to audit us. We also provide audit support. So if FDA or other regulatory agencies come to audit you and they have questions around the cloud, we would definitely answer that. We would definitely take uh, those calls. Um, basic stuff, you know, our systems are highly available. We put that commitment in, in contracts. We do all the backups and all the management around that. And we also take some cybersecurity liabilities on, uh, from you. Uh, so kind of gives you peace of mind. And when you mentioned audit support, uh, our current clients find us more as their partner, not just providing a leading technology, but an all as a partner in all aspects of what you've talked about today, Abbas. Yes. All right. So that that 
you've covered a lot of ground. Uh, what would you suggest to our audience the key takeaways that they should take with them after this webinar? Well, I mean, the fact is connected health, uh, digital health in general is here to stay. It has a momentum and it's going to keep having momentum. There are risks in terms of security, privacy, regulatory cost, and stuff like that. But the benefits you get in terms of greater convenience to the patients, greater convenience to the practitioners, easy, easier adherence, you know, better uh, patient compliance, improve insights that ultimately help you as a business, but also helps uh, the broader community. And the last thing is you know, better health outcomes. Hopefully, uh, this benefits everyone. And so that's there. And I think um, those benefits way outweigh the risk. And the risk can be very well managed. Very good. Very good. Wow. A lot, there's a lot to it, a lot to it. We're gonna go ahead and run our second poll, and that is now that we've covered a lot of ground all related to medical device connectivity, the hardware, the software, the regulatory, the security, the buy versus build, where do you feel you are in your connected device posture or status? First choice is we have a successful connectivity platform now implemented and in place, or our current connectivity solution could bear some improvement in one or all of these areas. Third choice is we could use some help planning our device connectivity strategy. Uh, fourth choice, dev device connectivity is too far out to think about right now. I've got some other fires to put out. And then fifth, cloud connectivity does not apply to us. So we're in good, good shape right now. We could bear some improvement. We could use help planning our device connectivity strategy. Device connectivity is too far out to think about, or fifth, it does not apply to us. Give you just a few more seconds. I see answers are rolling in. All right, we will go ahead and close out the poll. So to wrap things up before we get to our, our Q&A, let me suggest definitively what your next steps are. Um, I would highly recommend that everybody click the link that's in your chat window now, download and review Galen's Definitive Guide to Medical Device Connectivity. The link is in the chat window, goes into detail on many of the topics that Abbas talked about today, including actionable information. Not just here's what you need to do, but here's how you can start doing it. If there's any questions, any gaps, anything you can help us with, please don't hesitate to reach out. I would also suggest, number two, think about which topic we covered today that is most critical to your success and set it as a near-term priority to address. We're often focused on our device, the science, the medicine, the engineering. These other factors are important to your success as well. So pick one and start tackling it tomorrow. And then as always, if, if there's help you need with your cloud connectivity strategy, Galen Data is here to help. No commitment, we, we really enjoy learning about innovative applications of healthcare technology to specific use cases. Give us a call, shoot us an email. We'll, we'll do a go to webinar, go to meeting and um, see if we can help you. Um, I will announce our medical device partner ecosystem. Um, we know a lot about all the areas that um, Abbas covered today but we're not experts in all of them. We do have partners that are experts that can help. So if you go to galendata.com, click the about menu in the upper right and choose partners, you'll see our partner ecosystem. It's about a dozen companies, covers a wide range of the types of expertise that you likely need, and we can introduce you. These are not just companies where we grab their logo and put them on our webpage. We know the people, we've worked with the people, we are working together with them to the benefit of our, of our existing clients in many cases. So if there's anybody on there that you think can help you, please let us know and we'd be happy to start the conversation between you and them. I'll also announce our webinar next month. I'm really excited about it. Um, journey to medical device connectivity success. We're gonna explore the journey from beginning to end of two medical device companies, how they successfully decided to implement cloud connectivity, designed it, implemented it, uh, and the business value they enjoy today. We're gonna to be joined by Ed McCarthy of Somnera and Gregor Grady of Elementary, uh, two Galen clients, 
who have each, um, I, I've, I've spoken with each of them, they have very good stories to tell how they came to their decisions each point along the way and the benefits that they enjoy because of that. You can, uh, in the chat window right now, there's a link, you can register for that webinar right now. It's about a month, same day, same time on May 25th. So with that, um, we will get to our Q&A. You can submit your questions in the question window at any time in the GoToWebinar console. Uh, as a reminder, a recording of our webinar will be, a make, will be made available by email. So I am, let's see, questions are coming in. Let me see what we're, we're gonna take this one first, Abbas. It just came in. I'm not familiar with the term soup when you were talking about uh, the software questions. Could you define soup and, and why it's important? Yes, sure. So soup is a definition in IEC 6304, which is a standard for software development processes uh, in medical devices. And what it means is essentially software that you do not know how it was written, whether it was written on the compliance, whether there was quality processes around when those uh, software were developed. So essentially any software where you cannot vouch for their um, practices, for their stability, for their um, reliability uh, is essentially considered a soup. And that most of the open source software will fit into that, but also software that uh, that you cannot uh, get any kind of, uh, you know, even commercial software, commercial open source software, if you don't have a insight into how those was built, uh, those were considered a soup as well. So that's essentially saying, you know, potentially risky software, um, that you need to uh, put safeguards around. Uh, you need to understand the risks, you need to understand how you're going to mitigate those risks and what risks they are uh, and how does it affect your overall risk profile. And SOUP stands for Software of Unknown Provenance? Yes. So risky, we're not quite sure. And I want to wrap back to a statement you made when you were talking about software and that is the SBOM, the Software Bill of Materials. Just as it's important, every screw, every resistor, every chip in your medical device that's hardware, it's just as important to have that same inventory of software components. Uh, some of our partners we can introduce you to um, not only provide that capability, but also monitor in the general public vulnerabilities that those software components uh, may have as they're discovered and, and feed that information back to you. So. Uh, our partners are here to help. Uh, next question, when should we plan the connectivity aspect for our device? So I would say as soon as possible, uh, even though you may not implement it right away, you want to plan it up front. And the reason being because you know connectivity can change, uh, will change the requirements on your hardware, will change the requirements on kind of the data you collect. It changes how your device uh, interacts, how your device works. And so you have to consider all that upfront. Also implementing connectivity right away gives you an idea of if you're gonna implement it anyways uh, in, in, your, in your roadmap, implementing it right away can give you a leg up in, in understanding all the issues so you're not faced with changing things uh, midway or towards later stages of your development. So you wanna do it as early as possible because you know anything, any new thing, even if you're gonna use an existing system, there is something new about it. And you will have to understand the kind of the there's always issues with that, but you want to mitigate upfront and not wait till the end. Secondly, having connectivity uh, also can help with your uh, early evaluation, specifically if you're doing small scale studies um, or even large clinical studies. You can collect data easily instead of having to go through uh, you know having your uh, CROs having to manually collect data and transcribe it and, 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 and capture it that way. So it helps you in a lot of ways, can be more efficient right away. And a connected solution ultimately needs to be tested. So if you build it early, you can test it very well. And when you go to market, you have confidence that the system is going to work well. All right, very good. Uh, next question. Can you talk about how companies can use patient data, uh, RE consent form, HIPAA, et cetera? Sorry, I'm not, can, can you repeat that question? I'm not sure. Yeah, the question, question is how, can you talk about how companies, I'm assuming uh, medical device manufacturers, can use patient data such as consent form, HIPAA, maybe answer how patient data and, and getting a patient's consent to collect their data in the first place, how HIPAA wraps in, 
And that's primarily the responsibility of the medical device manufacturer. Although if their data is being sent to the Galen cloud, we have responsibility there as well. Sure, so patient data can be used um, in many different ways. Uh, ultimately it starts with consent from a patient. Uh, the patient has to consent uh, to a primary provider, like it could be hospitals, it could be directly the manufacturer, depending on your, your way you're selling it to, uh, to, to the patients or, or providing web service. Uh, consent essentially lists the kinds of things, kinds of data you collect, and what are you allowed to do with that data. And with that comes responsibilities. Uh, if you talk about HIPAA, you, know, you can get consent and use the data, but you're responsible to protect and safeguard the data. If you are a medical device company and you do that, you make sure your consent is, is, is there, uh, either directly with the customer, directly with the patient, or we are like your, uh, the patient's provider. At that point, uh, we are, if you are going to have other uh, vendors have access to our data, like for example, if you build on top of us, you know, we have access to our data, you need to make sure that there's agreements in place. So the responsibilities you have are transferred to all those vendors. And in HIPAA's term, it's called a business associate agreement. Um, everybody becomes a business associate to you and it has an agreement that outlines, again, same things. What data has been collected, what can be used for, and what are the responsibilities for that? Good answer, good answer. Okay, next question, and I'm going to add to it because I think it's a, really a, a two-parter, two or three-parter. What are the United States clinical providers' appetite for independent cloud solutions, i.e. yet another dashboard? And I would I would answer that in two ways, you know, the infrastructure itself, the network the connectivity, and how it integrates with the hospital network. But then uh, in parenthetically, the question to ask or asked yet another dashboard. And here she continues by asking, and what do they typically expect from manufacturers to integrate, including provisioning of users? So there's a lot to unpack there. Sure, so ultimately I think uh, that there will be a dashboard for teeth. Right. So if you if you had to log into 20 different systems and to for each device as a new system that you need to log in, there'll be a, a dashboard for So ultimately it's important to be able to interoperate specifically with a healthcare system, uh, record keeping uh, system like an EHR, uh, which most hospitals have. And EHRs have uh, opened up recently in the last 10 years or so, more and more, uh, so that it's better, it's easier, easier and easier to integrate. Uh, still a lot of work, uh, but it's easier than in previous times. Uh, but there's a lot of places where a dashboard don't exist. There are a lot of, you know, um, when you're doing things in a smaller clinic, so things in labs, but those kind of infrastructure doesn't exist. So you're going to have to cater to both uh, different kinds of uh, use cases, different kind of environments. Um, the, you know, it's important to find a solution that can kind of provide value across those infrastructure needs, right? Somewhere where you need a dashboard because one infrastructure doesn't exist, but also somewhere where you can actually integrate with an existing infrastructure like an EHR, uh, so that you can cater to very different um, user bases. Uh, one thing, providers aren't the only one needing access to data. More and more patients uh, need access to data. They want to see the data as well. They don't have an EHR, so you still need a dashboard for them. So it kind of you have to cater to a wide variety of stakeholders and hopefully find a system or build a system that can do that. And the second part of the question, and what do they typically expect, they being the clinical providers, from medical device manufacturers to integrate, including provisioning of users? Uh, that's, a, that's a topic when you were talking about the features and benefits of the Galen Cloud, Abbas, we really didn't have time to get into. So maybe you can comment now the, the concept of roles and how important different roles are when providing cloud connectivity. Sure, so provisioning, uh, same thing. I think uh, a large hospital system might want provisioning to happen through the EHR, with the EHR kind of integration can help. Uh, but then also you, you, in, in the non-hospital setting, you may want uh, provisioning to kind of trickle down, right? So have uh, different labs or different clinics do their own provisioning of patients, provisioning of their own users so that you're not being required to manage kind of a large install base uh, of your users. Next question, what does the 21st Century Cures Act mean for device connectivity? Sure, uh, so 21st Century Cures Act is a big piece of legislation that was three, four years ago. Um, it, it has a lot of stuff, on R&D, uh, money for R&D, money for uh, FDA breakthrough program, for example, as part of that. But for, I guess for connectivity, the 
things that apply is the interoperability uh, aspect to it, um, where the essential idea is that the patients have more access to data, uh, more access to their whole healthcare data. There's been you know, a big push uh, in allowing patients to access their own uh, information that is typically walled into an EHR. Uh, if you follow recent news, there's a, right now a requirement now that all EHRs have to comply with where patients can have access to what they call notes. So things that your doctor type when you're talking with them and they type all kinds of things about your healthcare. Uh, those are notes that are required to be accessible. And that's part of the 21st century cure drive. But ultimately it comes down to interoperability. Can, can patients have access to data? Can you take data out of those wall gardens uh, or hospitals and move them out and provide them access to data? Again, having connected devices make that life much easier because now you can move data around and provide access to a wide variety of stakeholders. Abbas, a question that came in during registration, which I think you covered during your presentation, uh, but I want to add a little bit of flavor to it. Could you please touch base on cybersecurity related aspects surrounding cloud-based connectivity? And you did, you spent a lot of time talking about that. But Abbas, would you agree that when we talk about security, cybersecurity, there are so many entry points beginning with the device itself, the wearable, the implantable, through the web app or base station to the cloud connectivity. There are so many entry points um, for uh, cybersecurity malfeasance that a security strategy, a cybersecurity strategy should be um, designed, if you will, or planned with all those different entry points in mind, not just, well, I've got security on my device, I'll worry about my cloud connectivity security later. Does that make sense? Yes, and cybersecurity, you know, best practice in cybersecurity is to look at a holistic system level view. So you look at the whole system and you find vulnerabilities, not just one component. So a system here is the entire medical device system, right? Not just a device, but your, as I said, your base stations, your, your users, uh, also the, the, the cloud or anything like that. Uh, so you have to kind of uh, understand the cyber risks, uh, the vulnerabilities, the kind of uh, attack vectors across the entire system and kind of devise a mitigation plan that covers that. So it's you, you can do component-based, you should do system-based or subsystem-based, uh, security planning, but you still need to do a system level security planning. So it's not just a simple matter of um, purchasing Norton firewall and antivirus and okay. applying you that should. at the last minute. No, you should definitely do that, but that's not enough. <laughs> Necessary. So um, oh, here's a good question, kind of strategic in nature. I like it. We are early stage and just now putting together our team to enter the design phase for our medical device. What type of expertise should I focus on when hiring? And does it make a difference in hiring that expertise if I decide to build versus buy? Sure, so it definitely makes a difference if you build versus buy. Build obviously requires more effort, which means translates to generally more people, a wider variety of skill set. you need both I you know software designers, but you also need you know uh, kind of UI UX. You need uh, verification engineers. You need uh, your quality people uh, that that need to be at least be able to uh, monitor some of the quality aspects. And then operationally, you need IT experts that uh, you know can understand the cloud, can understand the operational system, uh, have so a wide variety of skill set you need uh, to kind of build. Um, if you're buying, uh, that requirement comes down to low. Uh, you are more like again depends on how how much of that buying solution is going to be used as is. Uh, you may still need some development effort, but it's much reduced. Uh, you may need more of an integration, uh, kind of a project manager, product manager kind of uh, role to oversee the integration aspects, uh, but less more on the development side. Uh, so it just depends, uh, like any software development, there's a wide variety of roles uh, that need to be accounted for if you're going to build it. Uh Next question, this gets to broader integration with other uh, types of information systems. Uh, does the Galen cloud solution integrate with a majority of EHR, electronic health record systems in the US? Please elaborate. Sure, uh, so that's something we are building out right now. It's not available at this, this particular moment, but that's in our short-term roadmap and something that, that's being built out. When it's complete, uh, hopefully soon, uh, we will have integration across all major um, major EHR systems. Uh, most EHR systems use standards, 
uh, and we essentially are doing standard-based development. Uh, so this should work with pretty much all EHR systems that use that. But we know for sure all the major ones, if no, uh, if no, Epic, uh, Cerna, you know, and, and the likes of that, uh, are going to be able to uh, be integrated. It is. It is EHR integration is has been in the works for quite a while. It is yeah. something that is the system is designed. The platform is designed for that. It's just the final steps getting there that that needs to be accomplished. Yes. Right. Right. Very good. Um, okay. If you have a question, we've got time for one or two more. But I see no more questions in the console. So I will. Um, Thank you, Abbas, for being our panelist today in a very engaging, wide-ranging discussion. I'll encourage everyone to download the Definitive Guide to Medical Device Connectivity. The link is in the chat room, the chat uh, console right now. And thanks to the audience for attending our webinar today and for your very insightful questions. Uh, enjoyed them, enjoyed your presentation, Abbas, and uh, it, was a, it was a good conversation for sure. Uh, a reminder for next month's webinar, you can always register by going to galendata.com. But before we close out the webinar, the registration link is in the chat room. We're going to end the webinar here in a second. And when we do, please click the close button to take a short optional survey to let us know how we did. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone at a future Galen Data webinar. Please let us know if there's anything we can help you with between now and then. So thanks again and goodbye.